Hello. Uh, <laughs> this is my second go around, so if you're seeing this one, yay. Um, I'm back with another first chapter Friday, and I actually got some requests, which is great, uh, because I actually had, I think, almost every book that was requested. The bad news is they are all in my classroom. The good news is I'm going back next week. So next week's uh, first chapter Fridays and the rest of the first chapter Fridays for the school year are all going to be student requests. So that's awesome. Uh, I would be amiss without bringing up one special genre, though, before we go on to student requests, and that is nonfiction. Um, I am guilty all the time of saying, I don't really like this kind of book. I didn't like mysteries. I still hold that I might not like mysteries, but I read several this year, and I thought they were all great. And then I really don't like high fantasy. Harry Potter does not count. Um... But, like, there's just a certain fantasy genre that's just, like, not my thing. I'm reading that Gideon the Ninth book, and I think it's great. Nonfiction is another thing. I don't like a lot of nonfiction. But every nonfiction book I pick up, I mean, maybe it's because it's all about dinosaurs. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I think those are great, too. So I actually had a couple su suggestions, recommendations. Um, the first one was The Sixth Extinction. Sixth extinction and I read that one a couple years ago and it is I thought I owned it but I couldn't find it anywhere um so <clears throat> it is all about the idea that in our current time we are living during the sixth great extinction there have been other big great extinctions five of them um throughout our earth's history um the last one uh you know you've got um smaller ones bigger ones throughout but then of course there was the big dinosaur one that we always think of. Um, and then uh, now the rate of loss of biodiversity um, is such a big thing that we're looking at like extinction, mega extinction levels. So it was really interesting talking about global warming and the heating of the oceans and uh, the loss of the rainforest and stuff like that. So if you're interested, that's the sixth extinction. The book that I have for you <laughs> it's about dinosaurs um of course uh this is called the dinosaur artist by Paige williams and it's the dinosaur artist obsession betrayal and the quest for earth's ultimate trophy and it is all about fossil trade and fossil dealing um as some of you may know i have my very own fossil right here that i brag about all the time this is a spinosaurus tooth from the cretaceous age and it was found in the Bahrainian formation in Morocco, North Africa. I did not go to North Africa to get this. We bought this down in Branson from this dude, Prehistoric Fossils. You can like or follow them on Facebook or find them on TripAdvisor. Merv Feck, Feek, and it's in Branson. That's where I got it from. Um, so, real dinosaur tooth though. How did, it, how did this come to be? How did this get to Missouri and sit on my, my dresser and look at back, back at me every day? Well, this book is all about that because there are lots of interesting regulations uh, and depending on what country and where your fossil was procured, it may be illegal or um, might be perfectly fine. If I find something out in my backyard right now today, it won't be a dinosaur because we didn't live places where dinosaurs were, so boo-hoo. But if I did find a dinosaur in my backyard, that dinosaur would be mine. If it was the most amazing scientific discovery of our lifetime and it was in my yard, it would be mine. And that creates a conflict because I could keep it in my basement, I guess. Where would you? Uh, right up here in my bedroom. Um, I could keep it. And then science doesn't benefit from it. I could sell it, but if I sold it, how could I make sure that I got into the hands of a museum or somebody who would actually use it as opposed to somebody who may trade it and deal it Leonardo DiCaprio with all your dinosaurs in your house? Sweet. Um, call me. Um, but <laughs> invite me over. But how do you get it into the museum? And I know if this is kind of not your cup of tea, there are other formats where they talk about things like this. There's a great documentary. I think it's called Dinosaur 13. It is about the dinosaur that we know as Sue the T-Rex 
who now lives in the Field Museum in Chicago. She was found on property by fossil hunters. It was one person's property. They paid for it technically, but then not technically. And then the land may not have been that person's land to own. And so anyway, through a whole bunch of different avenues, the dinosaur ended up on, on auction and it was actually sold. And that's how the Field Museum got it, not because they were able to afford it, but because private corporations like McDonald's um, and others got involved and bought it for the Field Museum. Um, so it's a big industry and it's a big deal and there's a lot of controversy there. And that's what this book is all about. So I hope you enjoy the first chapter. Now there is an author's note at the beginning that just tells you that um, some of the names have been changed. Uh, but all these are real people, all these are real things. This book came out in 2018. So, um, there you go. All right. <clears throat> Introduction origins. In the summer of 2009, I came across a newspaper item about a Montana man convicted of stealing a dinosaur. The idea sounded preposterous. How was stealing a dinosaur even possible? And who would want to? Nearly a decade earlier, this man, Nate Murphy, who led fossil hunting tours in a geological signature in Montana called the Judith River Formation, had become well known for unveiling Leonardo, a late Cretaceous Brachiocephalosaurus, and one of the best preserved dinosaur skeletons ever found. A volunteer fossil hunter named Dan Stevenson had found the skeleton during one of Murphy's excursions on a private ranch near the small town of Malta. The remains cons constituted the first sub-adult of its kind on record, and remarkably still bore traces of skin scales, muscle, foot pads, and even his last meal in the stomach, National Geographic reported. To find one with so much external detail available, it's like going from a horse and buggy to a steam combustion engine, Murphy told the magazine. It will advance our science a quantum leap. Our science was an intriguing phrase. Murphy wasn't a trained scientist. He was an outdoorsman who taught him taught himself how to hunt fossils in the late in the Cretaceous bearing formations that run with photogenic accessibility through states like Wyoming, Utah, <clears throat> Montana, and South Dakota. He believed that he had something to offer paleontology, and presumably in pursuit of this idea, he had taken fossils that didn't belong to him, not Leonardo, another dinosaur. What at first appeared to be little more than a bizarre true crime story became, to me, an absorbing question of our ongoing relationship with natural history with the remnants of a world long gone. We know which life forms exist because we encounter them, but what came before? Answers can be found in rock. If you've ever picked up a shark tooth or a leaf imprinted stone, you were holding a fossil, a time portal, a clue. By definition, fossils are prehistoric organic remains preserved in the Earth's crust by natural causes. If you yourself would like to become a fossil, a specific chain of events must occur. Your corpse must not be eaten or scattered by scavengers or destroyed by other ruinous forces like weather and running water. You must be buried quickly in sediments or sand, metamorphic and igneous rock which form under conditions too superheated and volatile to preserve much of anything are no good at making fossils. But sedimentary rock, limestone, sandstone, proves an excellent tomb. Your soft tissues and organs will decompose, but unless they're obliterated by the Earth's incessant chemical and tectonic motions, the hard bits, teeth, and bone will remain. These will be infiltrated by groundwater and will mineralize according to whatever elements exist in the patch of Earth that has become your grave. Eventually, you may become part crystal or iron. Then, to even start to be scientifically useful, you must first be discovered. Good luck with all that. It's been estimated that less than 1% of the animal species that ever lived became fossils. While the process is rare, the product is ubiquitous, at least regarding some species. But which fossils are important to science and how should they be protected? Paleontologists have one answer, commercial fossil dealers another, and they've been fighting about it for generations. As the only record of life on Earth, fossils hold the key to understanding the history of the planet and its potential future. Studying them, scientists can better monitor pressing issues such as mass extinction and climate change. Hunting, collecting, or viewing them, anyone may feel connected to both the universe's infinite mystery and Earth's tangible past. To see the dinosaur bone beds of the Lyoning 
province of northeastern China is to see a landscape that 120 million years ago featured lush lakes and forests in the shadow of active volcanoes, to encounter gloss, glossopterist imprints and extinct seed fern found in South America, Africa, Australia, and Antarctica, is to witness evidence that those continents once existed as a single landmass. To hold a Kansas clam is to touch a relic of the Western Interior Seaway, which for roughly 20 million years bisected North America, overlaying what are now North Dakota, Wyoming, Colorado, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Florida, along with parts of 14 other states and swaths of Canada and Mexico. Fossils are found in every part of the world, and so are fossil collectors, who are legion. Collectors spend significant chunks of their lives hunting for fossils, researching fossils, buying fossils, displaying fossils, trading fossils, visiting fossils in museums, and talking, and talking, and talking about them. Fossil enthusiasts are as obsessed as a segment of natural history lovers has ever existed. I have been in people's houses where every possible inch of their home is covered in fossils, the vertebrate paleontologist Mark Norrell of the American Museum of Natural History once said, even the dishwasher has trilobites in it. This, minus the dishwasher, has been going on for millennia. As humans collected the remains of one life form after another, naturalists built an inventory of the planet's former inhabitants. That inventory today is known as the fossil record, a compendium that is postulated, debated, and revised by paleontologists through peer-reviewed research, providing a portion of time lost, of lost time. Without fossils, an understanding of the Earth's formation and history would not be possible. Without fossils, we would not know the Earth's age, 4.6 billion years. We would not know when certain creatures lived, when they died out, how they looked, what they ate. Without fossils, natural history museums might not exist. The geologic time scale would not exist because knowledge of the Earth's strat stratigraphy or layers would not exist. We would not know what the continents were. Not, we would not know that the continents were not always where they are now, and that Earth's shifting, sliding plates rearrange land and sea. We would not know the climate has warmed and cooled and is changing still. We would not know that the mass, the five mass extinctions have occurred, and that we're in the sixth one now. See, they mention it here too. We would have no idea of an ice age without fossils. We would not know that birds evolved from dinosaurs or that Earth was already billions of years old before flowering plants appeared, or that sea creatures transitioned to life on land and primates to creatures that crafted tools, grew crops, and started wars. We would not know that rhinos once lived in Florida and sharks swam around the Midwest. We would not know that Stegosaurus lived millions of years before T-Rex, an animal that, in geologic time, is closer to human beings than to the first of its kind. The Earth's layers are, in, are finite. Each has a beginning, middle, and end, like tiramisu, wherein lady fingers meet mascarpone. The most recent layers hold mammals, fishes, and birds not terribly different than those that are alive today, but the further back one goes, the more fantastical some of the creatures. The fossil record shows that life began with microscopic organisms and flourished to the unthinkably gargantuan animals of the Mesozoic, a 160 million year era that ended some 65.5 million years ago. In the age of reptiles, dinosaurs crashed through forest, terrorized prey, zipped around like overstimulated roadrunners, and love loved along, looking for something leafy to eat and trying to avoid being eaten. Their remains continually surfaced as weather, erosion, and civilization peel the planet layer by layer. Fossils are the single most important clue to understanding how the planet evolved, yet attitudes toward their protection vary from continent to continent and from state to state. The United States, a particularly fossil-rich country, is unusual. Policymakers have had no desire to mess with private property laws, so it remains true that if you find fossils on your own land or on private property where you have permission to collect, they're yours to keep or sell or ignore or destroy, no matter what or how scientifically important the specimen may be. Three prim primary groups of people seek and covet fossils, paleontologists, collectors, and commercial hunters. Paleontologists hone their expertise through undergraduate, graduate, and doctoral courses that immerse them in geology, evolutionary biology, zoology, computer science, statistical analysis, ecology, chemistry, climatology, and other maths and sciences. They're, they pursue specialties in areas like paleobotany, fossil plants, invertebrate paleontology, animals without backbones like mussels and corals, micropaleontology requires a microscope, 
and vertebrates, backbones. Paleontologists tend to work in academia and museums, publishing their research in peer-reviewed scientific journals such as Geology and the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. Scientists believe it crucial to protect certain types of fossils by banning their trade. Commercial dealers, on the other hand, hunt, sell, and buy fossils at trade shows, in privately owned natural history shops, and online. It's entirely legal to sell some fossils and illegal to sell others, and it's often been hard for consumers to know the difference. Many dealers grew up hunting fossils and might have studied natural sciences in college if they'd had the chance. Most are self-taught. Many are libertarians and believe that they should be able to do whatever they want as long as they're not hurting anybody. Many loathe government regulations and feel entitled to fossils, taking the view that the earth belongs to everyone. Most fossil dealers feel that by collecting and selling fossils, they're rescuing materials that otherwise would erode, and that their industry provide, provides a valuable service by supplying classrooms and collectors, and, in some cases, museums, and by encouraging widespread interest in the natural world. Commercial hunters take pride in selling to museums, but they also court wealthy private collectors. Successful dealers can make a living in fossils, though it's rarely a get-rich game, since so much of the profit folds back into the hunt. Overseas museums, especially those proliferating in China, Japan, and the Middle East, have no problem buying commercially, while public museums in the United States, those supported by tax dollars, tend not to shop the market, preferring to collect their own materials under scientific conditions. While both a commercial hunter and a paleontologist may also be a collector, no reputable paleontologist is a dealer. Paleontologists do not sell fossils, for much of the same reason hematologists don't peddle vials of blood. Fossils are data. It's been said. A fossil's contextual information is as important as the fossil itself. Extracting a fossil minus that correlating data has been compared to removing a corpse from the scene of a homicide without noting, say, the presence of shell casings or biological evidence like blood. Approximate cause and time of death may be inferred, but a fossil alone cannot tell the whole story. In fact, the whole story can never be told, at least not without a time machine. But the story starts to come together through the analysis of details, like the circumstances of fossilization, called taphonomy, the presence of other fossil animals and plants, and stratigraphy, which helps paleontologists understand when the animal lived and died. The enormous femurs found protruding from the big bone lake bogs of Kentucky, as happened in the 1700s, tell one story. The three-toed footprints found in sa found Sands bones in Connecticut River Valley of Massachusetts, as happened in the 1800s, tell another. For decades, the federal government debated whether and how to regulate fossil collecting, particularly regarding vertebrates, which are less common than invertebrates. The most extreme-minded paleontologists have long wanted a ban on commercial collecting, but commercial hunters organized against the idea. They defended their trade, and paleontologists <clears throat> defended the objects fundamental to their science. Despite experience and field ex expertise, dealers who call themselves commercial paleontologists are not, in fact, paleontologists. Paleontology would not exist without them, though. The science started at the hands of natural history lovers, started long before the words science and paleontology even existed, and became perhaps the only discipline with a commercial aspect that simultaneously infuriates scientists and claims a legitimate role in the pantheon of discovery. The work of commercial hunters has allowed paleontologists some of their biggest breakthroughs and museums their most stunning displays. Museum visitors may not realize they're often looking at specimens discovered not by scientists, but rather by lay people like themselves. A, Calif a California boy named Harley Garbani became obsessed with fossils in the 1930s after finding part of a camel femur while following in the tracks of his father's plow. He became a plumber, but went on to find extraordinary tiny fossils by crawling on his hands and knees in cheaters, jeweler's goggles, plus the first significant triceratops skeleton in over half a century and a T-Rex skeleton so good it would take years for someone to come across a better one. By the time Garbani died in 2011, he'd collected for the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and the University of California Berkeley's Museum of Paleontology. Lowell Dingus, an American Museum of Natural History, paleontologist who knew Garbani while in grad school at Berkeley called him among the greatest fossil collectors that ever lived and the greatest one that I've ever known and worked with. A more recent collector was Stan Sacreson, Stan Sacreson, an electrician and plumber from Harding County, South Dakota, the self-declared T-Rex capital of the world, 
In the 80s and 90s, Secrecen found such notable wreck specimens that with each new discovery, his twin brother Steve, a particular or part-time grave digger and equally gifted fossil hunter, carved notches into the handle of his bobcat earth mover. Discovering even one or part of a T-Rex was a feat, given the fewer than 15 had been unearthed. The Sarkosian twins, who lived in the tiny town of Buffalo, had grown up near fossil beds and were taken with the hunt. They had learned that it was smart to search after a big storm or a spring thaw because weather and erosion unwrapped gift of, gifts of bone. They had familiarized themselves with the geology, knowing it's, it's pointless to search for mastodon and rock formations 100 million years old, as it is to search for Vulcandon in sediments that laid down during the Pleistocene. Another name is to remember is Kathy Wankel. When the Smithsonian National Museum of History unveils its new hall of dinosaurs in 2019, after a five-year, $48 million rest, renovation, it will feature for the first time its own Tyrannosaurus Rex, courtesy of Wankel, a Montana rancher, who in 1988 found the skeleton now known as the nation's T-Rex. The specimen is considered important partly because it includes the first complete T-Rex forelimb known to science. Despite amateurs' contributions, science and commerce developed stark opposing arguments. Commerce, overregulation destroys the public's interest in the natural world. Science, commodification compromises our evolving understanding of the planet. Commerce, science doesn't need hundreds or even dozens of specimens of one species. Science, multiple specimens elucidate an organism and its environment over time. Commerce, private collectors wind up donating their stuff to museums anyway. Science, specimens collected under non-scientific conditions are worthless to research. Commerce, most museum most museum fossils land in storage, never to be studied. Science. Stored fossils have generated profound advances decades after their discovery. Commerce. Scientists are stingy and elitist, and their snooty PhDs. Science. Commercial hunters are destructive and greedy. Such were the contours of a seemingly intractable conflict. Whether or not it's okay to sell and buy fossils is a matter of debate on scientific and ethical grounds, with analytical rigor and professional history squaring off against free enterprise. The paleontologists Kenshu Shimada and Philip Curie and other colleagues wrote in Paleontolog Paleontologica Electronica, they called the battle against heightened commercialization of fossils the greatest challenge to paleontology of the 21st century. On both sides, the disagreement struck people as a shame, because scientists and commercial hunters, at least, were united in their love of one thing, fossils. If only more people would take a, sci a sincere interest in rocks that can talk to you, the paleo paleobotanist Kirk Johnson, head of Smithsonian's uh, Natural History Museum, once told me, the fact that our planet buries its dead is amazing. The fact that you can read history of the planet in fossils is profoundly cool. A smart kid can find a fossil and tell you what happened to the planet four billion years ago. We finally figured out how the planet works, and we did it through fossils. If the confessed dinosaur thief Nate Murphy became an emblem of the tension between science and commerce, he didn't reign for long. In the spring of 2012, a case emerged that surpassed all others in its international scope and labyrinthine particulars, touching on collectors, smuggling, marriage, democracy, poverty, artistry, museums, mining, Hollywood, Russia, China, criminal justice, presidential politics, explorers, Mongolian culture, the auction industry, and the history of science. This book is that untold story. All right, so that is The Dinosaur Artist by Paige Williams. I hope you enjoyed that. If this is something that interests you, there's lots of great fossil like YouTube channels out there. There's the documentary I mentioned about Sue. This is a great book. The Sixth Extinction kind of deals with this stuff, but it's mostly like current like events, biodiversity now type things, but it does touch on other extinctions too. So it's very interesting as well. Um, but if you're into natural history, I think you would really like this and I hope you check it out. Um, I hope you enjoyed our first chapter. I will see you again next week. I miss you. I love you. Bye.